Acadians in the St. John Valley today make their living much the same way their ancestors did when they first arrived 200 years ago. Some grow potatoes on the sandy hills that rise up on both sides of the river, and many men cut lumber in Maine's north woods. Lumbering has always been hard and lonely work. Men would often leave home for four months at a time, spending the winter in lumber camps deep in the woods. To pass the long evening hours, the woodsmen would break out accordions, harmonicas, and fiddles, and play old Acadian jigs and reels. That's the music of Alfred Parent of Van Buren. These days there are more radios than fiddles in the lumber camps, but fiddlers like Parent still play at informal kitchen parties called soirees. Throughout the St. John Valley, Acadian tradition manages to coexist with modern life. <laughs> Sunday afternoon is amateur hour at the Madawaska Club in the valley's largest town, Edmonston, New Brunswick. Residents come from both the U.S. and Canadian sides of the river to enjoy an afternoon of local talent. Most contestants sing popular or country and western tunes, but they share the stage with those who still play the old music. A woman plays the harmonica while her daughter does a traditional step dance. Music has always been important to the Acadians. For much of their history, songs were used to pass the culture from one generation to the next. Most important in this respect is the song Evangeline. Some say if the Acadians had a country, it would be their national anthem. Here it's sung by Lawrence Parent. Many Valley residents still remember singing Evangeline at the start of every school day, and it still opens any public meeting of the Acadians. Evangeline reminds the Acadians of the darkest moment of their history the deportation of 1755. It tells the story of the legendary romance of Evangeline and Gabrielle, whose lives were torn apart by British persecution. That story symbolizes the history of all Acadians. Ever since their arrival on the shores of Nova Scotia in the early 1600s, the Acadians found themselves trapped in a power struggle between England and France. The Acadians were a small band of middle-class French farmers, drawn to the New World for the chance to own their own farms. As their settlement grew, the Acadians found themselves increasingly isolated from their homeland. The aristocrats who controlled the territory were more interested in fur trapping than governing. So left to their own devices, the Acadians developed their own institutions, culture, and dialect. But the Acadians weren't insulated from old world conflicts, 
Over the course of the 17th century, their territory changed hands 14 times. When the British were in control, they harassed the Acadians, resenting their devout Catholicism and their allegiance to France. In 1755, the British forced the moment, demanding an oath of allegiance to their king, Acadian historian Donald Sear. These people were really caught in the middle. The country had changed hands 14 times before. Why shouldn't it change hands again? And when you're an Acadian swearing an oath, an oath means that if I do not abide by this, I'm going to go to hell, period. And you don't rescind an oath. So if you swear allegiance to the King of England and the country is given back to the King of France, where are you? And so they refused to take that oath of loyalty. When the Acadians refused the oath, the British officers arrested them. Forcing the men on one ship, the women on another, they deported thousands to the British colonies to the south. The colonels in each town, like Colonel Winslow in Grand, Grand Prix, they were told, you know, do what you can to get as many of them under arrest as possible. So we called all the men and boys over 10 years old to the church for a decision by the king about the oath of loyalty. And Once they get in the church, he placed them under arrest. They were held in the church for a long time and then put on ships and held in the harbor for a long time. And then when it came time to board the women and other children onto the ships, there were a lot of ships and families. Of course, the men and boys were separated from the women. There was a lot of confusion and uh, it was a pretty bad situation. They were, they got onto the ships, however, singing, Vive la Croix, long live the cross, that kind of thing. They knew what was, they couldn't believe it was happening. They really couldn't believe because they'd been threatened with this for so long. Uh, their farms were burned in front of them while they were being loaded on the ships. So they knew there was nothing to come back to. Most of the elderly died en route. Many families were never united again. After the deportation, the Acadians tried to locate their loved ones. Many thought their best chance would be in Louisiana, the last French stronghold in the New World. They became the group now known as the Cajuns. But others headed north, determined to return home. Historian Donald Sear. Of course, the natural thing is to reassemble your family. And if you're in Georgia and you, of course, there's mutterings all up and down the eastern seaboard. Acadians talking, you know, passing messages back and forth, where is so-and-so, and everyone's trying to find out where their families are. And if they think they're in Quebec, they go to Quebec. If they think they're in Acadia, they go to Acadia. If they think they're in Louisiana, they go to Louisiana. And some of them never saw their loved ones again. A lot of them never saw their loved ones again. They didn't know who had died. They didn't know anything. Some of them walked back to Acadia through the American Revolution by 17... 63, they were freed to go where they wanted. But a lot of them were trying to get back to Acadia. The St. John Valley was an area isolated enough to allow them to practice their religion and rebuild their culture without interference. Ironically, that song, Evangeline, the treasured record of the Acadians' will to survive, is based on a poem by the English-speaking Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Allagash poet Jim Connors says Longfellow's Evangeline was invaluable to the Acadians in their efforts to preserve their identity. Think of what a great, great thing uh, Longfellow did when he wrote Evangeline. At the time, at the time, the, about the only ones that were literate, were the priests among that among those Acadians. They were people that lived very close to the soil. Later on, true, they 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 had schools and everything. But their records and everything were primarily kept by the priests, and they did a good job too. 
But Longfellow did a good job in 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 dramatizing the the story of the expulsion of the Acadians from Nova Scotia, you know. This is the forest primeval, the murmuring pines and the hemlocks. Bearded with moss and in garments of green, indistinct in the twilight, stand like druids of old with voices sad and prophetic. Stand like harpers hoar with beards that rest on their bosoms. Nearby from its rocky caverns, the deep-mouthed neighboring ocean speaks and in accents disconsolate answers the wail of the forest. Oh, this is the forest primeval, but where are the hearts that beneath it? Leap like the heart of the roebuck when he hears in the woods the voice of the hunter. That's the introduction to Evangeline. It's the story of, of the, actually the disruption of their lives and everything. Longfellow had a, had, he was a great poet and had a way of putting it together. He, he immortalized it is what he did and he, they had jealously guarded, religiously guarded their way and their language and their, their, uh, their ways, their church meant all kinds of things to them, and uh, they began to have fears that it was passing, that it was being forgotten, with, especially with the advent of a lot of them here along the river on the American side. They began to the English language seemed to be uh, dominating to the extent that they would lose their French language entirely. So they began to uh, search along with everybody else to, for their roots, you might say. And it started their, their uh, movement to preserve their culture and and uh, preserve their lineage, their history. And uh, Evangeline helped an awful lot. The Acadians who came to the valley brought with them a devout Catholicism, a French dialect that had changed little in 200 years, and a large body of songs. And today, a large Catholic church is the centerpiece of most valley towns. Though English dominates, Acadians still speak their dialect, and some, like Ida Roy, are still singing the old songs. Toujours de campagne, écoutez ma chanson. Une chanson a été faite, été faite et composée. Un soir dans les chantiers, était bien estropié. Ida Roy grew up in the valley, in the town of Saint Agathe. While most from her generation remember some of the Acadian songs, Ida is a singing encyclopedia of Acadian history. She can recall from memory nearly 600 songs. She's written down the words so they won't be lost and carries all the tunes in her head. Ida learned all those songs the traditional way. They were handed down one generation to the next, like treasured family heirlooms. At the time when I was young, uh, well, my father and mother, well, uh, we had no, no uh, television. And my dad had, had a radio, but it was battery, and he was saving his battery for uh, taking the news at night. Yeah. So we couldn't play the radio too much, so I was crocheting and singing. That's, what, that's the way we learned. La mort est si suprême qu'il y a pas pu recevoir le prêt en pensant à Dieu lui-même sans pouvoir se reconnaître on le prend on le l'enveloppe droit au camp on le transporte on envoie à partir les hommes pour nous voir arriver 
je vous dis que c'est pas mal triste de mourir par accident pour un jeune homme de son âge qui est mort à 25 ans. Acadians call this kind of slow plaintive song a complaint. It relates a sad, true story, in this case about the death of a lumberjack in a woods accident. The song was written by Ida's brother-in-law, Al Simador. The victim in the story was her cousin. He uh, fell. He fell 20 feet uh, high from uh, um, some the um, The logs. The logs. The log started to tumble down, and he tumbled down with the logs, and he fell. His neck on a set of bobsled. He broke his neck. And my husband was there. He wasn't there when it happened, but he was in the camp. He was. Uh, my brother-in-law was working at night, and he was supposed to come home that day. He got killed that morning about, uh, I think it was 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. My husband was sleeping in the camp at the time when they went to get my husband, said that his brother was, they told him he had an accident, but he didn't know he was dead. So, Al Mador made a song on him. It wasn't... Uh, it was a relative, it was a cousin, so he made the song. Il a descendu sur Michel, c'était pour le faire embaumer. Après que la job fut faite, droit chez eux le transporter. Quelle tristesse pour son père et sa mère, voir arriver son enfant. Je vous dis qu'ils ont versé des larmes, ils vont lui passer longtemps. C'est à l'église de Daigle, son service t'est chanté. C'est pas mal triste pour son père et sa mère, voir en terre et son enfant. Je vous dis qu'ils ont versé des larmes, ils vont lui penser longtemps. La complainte qui a été composée, c'est Alcimador qui l'a composée. Si vous la trouvez pas bien de même, mes amis, vous l'excuserez. That's what, uh, with no education, that uh, Alcimador, he wasn't an educated man. And he made the song like uh, the feeling of his, what he was his cousin. As with many Acadian complaints, the song ends with a disclaimer. The author identifies himself, explains how he came to know the story, and then apologizes to the listeners in case the song fails to do justice to its subject. Ida Roy says a complaint like this is one way a family can express and share its grief. The complaint, the complaint that I know that the people made is from someone that uh, was sad about what happened and mostly it's the relatives that was uh, making the songs and uh, only saying their feelings because they were sad for what happened. And they wasn't educated, so they was making the song like they think it was right for them, even though some of the words maybe could be uh, better. It could be better, but uh, for them it was right. Ida Roy says that because Acadian farmers and woodsmen lived a hard life, many of their songs were sad. But the Acadians also used music to celebrate. Bana banam si tu jouais, bana banam si tu jouais, si tu jouais de ce bouteille là, si tu jouais de ce bouteille là, clou 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 de ce bouteille là, ta ra ta ta de ce cornet là, bing bing bang de ce tambour là, flut 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 de ce flûte là, zing 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 de ce violon là, banam tu n'es pas mal de ta maison, car nous y sommes, tu n'es pas mal de ta maison, car nous y sommes. Most of Ida's songs were written to be performed without accompaniment, but the Acadians also developed a strong tradition of instrumental music. Ida's father, one of the best singers in the area at the time, used to turn his farm in St. Agathe into a dance hall. There, fiddlers like Alfred Parent would play the Acadian jigs and reels, while others joined in a traditional square dance the Acadians call a quadrille. The, the, the barn was cleaned up and 
there were no he in that barn. Uh, well, he, he put he after that, but the barn was new, and he made some Fourth uh, of July and a wedding. We had weddings, and it was nice. There were a lot of people that was coming. I was about uh, 14 to 15 years at the time. I was between them, and I was dancing too. Alfred Parent played over the years with many of the Valley's best fiddlers, but he had to teach himself to play because he grew up in one of the so-called back settlements off the main road, far from the company of fellow musicians. There was no violin player around, no. And we were living the last house in the back settlement there. No phonograph, we had a phonograph, but no record, only a uh, few songs, French songs, Vive la Canadienne. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, shoot all of like that. But at that time, there was record, good record in Edmundston, but I didn't know that, and we didn't have a car. And when I was uh, older, that I heard there was good violin player play, oh, geez, I, I was sick. <laughs> <laughs> Alfred Parent's fiddle tunes and Ida Roy's songs are a vast archive of local history, passed down from one generation to the next. But Ida worries that someday that link will be broken. Her children, for example, aren't learning the songs. Those days, they didn't have radio those days. And it was in the wood, and to pass the time, they were singing and they were making, uh, uh, telling stories and something like that. Pass the time. Now they got radio, they got TV, and so they don't do that anymore. And that that's why we're doing that is to to not forget the old times, because the old times. Uh, I I think that will go away. The children nowadays they don't do that anymore. But I don't know. We'll continue that. American and Canadian TV and radio have taken their toll on the valley's cultural life but the Acadians have reason to be hopeful about their future. They're starting to take a more active role in preserving and promoting their heritage. Less than a generation ago, children on the American side of the river were punished for speaking French at school. Now it's a required course. And in the past 10 years, each of the dozen towns in the valley has started a historical society or cultural center. And in kitchens on both sides of the river, the soirees continue. Mm -hmm. 